to our last um, Math 1324 um, Happy Math Hour. Thank you for joining me. Um, the semester is almost over. Um, you all just have one more week. We we were doing presentations for summer one. So um, don't forget that the 4th of July, the Thursday, you have a day off. So make sure you uh, check with your instructors. You might finish before the 4th or, or maybe after the 4th. So, so this is our last week together. Um, so um, let's go ahead and get started. So for today's session, we will be reviewing for your exam four. Hopefully you're either taking it today or in the weekend if you're having an online class. So let's go ahead and start. So the problem says, write the resulting set using the list listing method. So again, the listing method um, is just listing all of the elements uh, that are in our objects. And um, remember, we do not want to include duplicates when working with sets, okay? So here, uh, we wanna find A union B. So that symbol means that we wanna find all of the elements that are both in A and B. That's how we wanna um, represent this um, symbol, the, like a big U, the union, is like the and, right? So, so we start with, um, with A, we're going to include all, everything in A, and A is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So we're going to include and B. So um, 1 and 3 were not in A, so we have to include those. And 5 was not, so not in A, so we have to include those, that one. And 7, 7 would be our last one. So the union of A and B are 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 1, 3, 5, 7. Again, the order doesn't matter. Um, what does matter is, again, we do not want to include duplicates. As you can see, there was a 2 in the, in the um, set A and a 2 in set B. We do not want to include duplicates. We only include them one time. Okay. All right. So let's do another one. So again, you can reorder it. This is just me. I, I like to have things in order, um, but you don't have to for your computer, okay? And again, um, if you're face-to-face -face class on, on paper, your instructor shouldn't mind either the order. All right, so now let's do this one. Find the A intersection B. That's what this symbol means. We want to find the elements that are an A and um, or in B. That's how we want to represent it in English. Okay, so we have these two sets, A and B. So what we want is we want A or B. So here um, um, we have the two that's in A and or, um, or B. Um, and then we have another one. We have four that's also in B. Uh, we don't have a six on both. Uh, we don't have an eight on both and we don't have a 10 on both. So then our answer would just be these two elements here. Um, oh, sorry, I missed a C, six. So we have a six and a six, and that would be it. So our intersection of A and, with B, or A or B, would be just these, two, four, and six, okay? All right, so this would be our answer. Um, now we want to find B complement. Okay, so that's what that little hyphen uh, means. We want the complement to be. And what is the complement to be? Complement to be is everything but uh, what's uh, everything that's not in B, right? So for instance, this is our universe. Our universe are all of the elements that are included in this set. Um, and that's what, um, don't get confused with that U. It's in italics with the big solid um, bold U that we have for union, okay? This uh, italics U um, represents the the universe. And when we say universe, is all of the elements that we are evaluating or looking at. It's all of our values in our set, okay? So our universe contains the numbers from one through 15. So we wanna find um, all of the numbers that are not in B. So again, um, our elements in B are these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but we do not want any of these. So the complement of B would be all of the numbers that are not these. So what would be the answer? Our answer would be not considering any of these, okay? But our answer would just be the remaining, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, okay? So that's how we find its complement. All right. How about this one? 
find the subset of C. So the subset of C um, is um, are elements that are are included in C, okay, um, but not necessarily all of them. So let me explain to you as an example. So if I want to see that um, C is one, three, five, I want to find a subset where I have these elements also included, okay? So for instance, the subset of C, um, the first thing that you we like to review is that um, this uh, zero with a slash, it means the empty set. And all, all sets have a subset of the empty set that's um, included, okay? Uh, empty set means that um, we don't, we're not looking at any element. All right, so a subset of C would also just be one by itself, okay? Um, would be three by itself, would be five by itself. So those are individually. So don't forget um, your empty set. It's included in all subsets. Um, and then we can look them individually, one as a subset, three and five. But now we can have also, that was with one. Now we can have two, okay? One and three would be a subset of C. Um, one and five would be a subset of C. And three and five would be a subset of C, okay? So, oh, and then we can't forget, one, three, five is also a subset of C, okay? So a subset of, is, is our elements that are in our set C. So again, empty set, don't forget our empty set. Empty set is a subset of every set, okay? All right, so this would be our answer, right? Now, let's look at uh, an application problem. Let the universal set U be the set of all 120 students in the class. A, the set of students from a college of arts and science, B, the set of students from College of Business, and F, the set of freshmen, and S, the set of sophomores. So again, our universe here, again, what that means is all of the, all of the elements that we're considering, and in this case, it's 120 students in a class, okay? So um, we label our different sets. We have a set A that are our students from the College of Arts and Science, a different set B, um, which are students from the College of Business. And, they, and you see here, they, they relate to, to values. Um, in the College of Business, we have 66 freshmen, we have 21 sophomores. Um, oh, and again, I forgot to, to um, remind you all or, or, or comment that if you have a question um, or a comment, please unmute your mic and, and just go ahead and ask me, okay? I don't have access to, to the chat since I'm um, sharing my screen. So feel free to just unmute yourself and stop me if you have any questions, okay? Um, so let's go ahead and answer some of these questions. Um, and it's nice to label just how we were seeing with numbers. Let's label this application. So let's say that our A again is our arts and science. Our B is our business. We label our F for our freshman, S for our sophomore, okay? So the question to you is find N of S. So what this means with the little N, N means I need to find all of the elements in S. That's what how uh, we wanna read that. We wanna read find all of the elements in S. So again, S stands for the sophomore. So to find all of the elements in the sophomore is just adding all of the sophomores we have. We have 14 in the arts and science. We have 21 in the business. So 14 plus 21 is 35. So all of the elements for um, N of S is 35, okay? So very similar, number six, find um, all of the elements in B. So what they're asking me is I wanna find all of the students that are taking a business um, class. So again, uh, the business class are 66 freshmen, 21 sophomores. So I add these two numbers and it gives me the 87 students. So the, the students taking business are 87. All right, now let's look at seven. Find the intersection of the business students with the arts and science students. So we, I only wanna, I only wanna see the ones who are 
sharing both that are both in business and in science. Yes, only in those students that are in both classes, right? So if we look here, um, we see here that in business, we have 21 students um, that are sophomores. Now we have a total of 87, but we're only interested in the ones that are sophomores that are in business. And it's easy to see in our table that the sophomores that are taking business, our answer is 21. It's just that straightforward. So our answer here for the intersection of business students with sophomores is 21. Let's look at the opposite. Find the number of students that are in business and are sophomores. So now I'm looking at, at um, all of the students that are in business and I wanna know all of the students that are sophomores. So here we need a formula, okay? So to find the union of two elements, um, again, we wanna find all of the elements in A and all of the elements in B, but you gotta keep in mind, just what I said before, we, do ne we never wanna include duplicates. So that's why that we, we give you this in a formula. This is saying that I want all of the elements in A, I want all of the elements in B, but I wanna take away all of the ones that are sharing both A and B. So the intersection, that means the, all the duplicates. I don't wanna include duplicates. So let's go ahead and do this. So we know that we wanna find the elements in business plus the, um, or all the students in business plus all the students that are sophomores and we want to subtract all that are both in uh, business and sophomores we want to take our uh, duplicates so let's go ahead and do it so our number of students in business are 87 our number of students that are sophomores are 35 and we want to take away the ones that they share in this case is 21 so when i do this um, our answer is 101 so the union of B with S or the number of students that are in business and in um, our sophomores is 101, okay? Hopefully easy stuff. All right, so our answer is 101. All right, let's look at this next example. A single playing card is drawn at random from an ordinary 52 deck card. Find the probability of drawing um, the following, okay? So first, let's go ahead and represent what our cards look like, a deck of cards. So what I've discovered lately is most of my students have never seen a deck of cards. So um, I like to display them here. So a deck of cards is made out of 52 cards, playing cards. Um, and some of you might know this already, you know, we love to use deck of cards for, for randomness or even for probability, which we'll see also, um, because we can, have a lot of outcomes. A deck of cards has a lot of things to pick from. You know, it's 52 cards to start with. Um, the cards come in two different colors, black and white. Um, some the cards, some of cards have what called our face cards. Some cards are number cards. Um, um, we also have four different shapes in our cards. We have clovers, diamonds, hearts, and and diamonds. You know, so so there's a lot of things that help us or we like to use in um, doing probability and randoms, right? So, so again, in this case, we wanna find the probability of drawing a queen. So we have a formula. And again, let's review here our cards. We have 13 clubs, 14 spades, 13 hearts, um, 13 diamonds, okay? So we have a total of 52 cards. Again, 26 of them are black, 26 are red. Okay, we have three face cards for each unit. These are it, our jack, queen, and king. These are the cards that I'm saying that we have a face, okay? We also have um, some, the number cards. And again, you can see them, they're from two through 10. And then we have an ace that, uh, for those who play poker or cards, we usually think of our ace as our number one, right? So our solution is this. This is the formula for probability of an event. So it's the probability of an event is equal to, again, here's this term again, N of E. So N of E is the number of the elements in our event, okay, over N of S. N of S in probably stands for our sample size. It means that all of the possibilities that we can have, okay? So let's go ahead and review this. 
uh, if n of s is our sample size, all of the elements or items that we can have, in this case, since we're dealing with a deck of cards that has 52 cards, this is our sample space. Our sample space is 52 cards, okay? Now, if we wanna find the probability of the event being a queen, so we're gonna do this um, ratio, this division, right? Our sample, our, our, our N of E, which is our number of events, if you see, we have four queens in our picture is that we have two queens that are black, which are the clubs and spades, and we have two queens that are the red cards, the hearts and diamonds. We have a total of four queens. Those are, that's the number of items that are part of the N of, e R of our element, right? So we're gonna divide this by our sample space, which is 52. So when we simplify this fraction, uh, we have four over 52, which is gonna give us one over 13. Okay, so this is our probability. The probability of, of getting a deck of card and picking at random a queen is one out of 13 chances. Okay, how about B, a diamond? All right, so our diamond is our N of E, our element. Um, what, what, are, what is our quantity, our numbers that we can get by choosing a diamond? So again, we can see that there are 13 diamonds, they're in red, right? We Right now we're not interested in the color, we just wanna know what the suit is and then we call them suits, right? So we have 13 diamonds, that's our number of elements that we can have by this probability over our sample space. Again, this doesn't change, um, is 52. So we have this fraction, 1352, we always wanna simplify our fractions and we have one four. So one out of four chances that at random, if handed a deck of cards, we'll pick a diamond, okay? All right, now let's deal with the color, right? Uh, probably using color. Then hopefully it's easy to see. Um, it's like a flipping a coin, but let's just go through it, okay? What is the probability of a red card? So a red card, our N of E, is the number of elements that we can choose that are red cards. So again, half of the cards are red. So it's 26 out of the 52. We're gonna divide that over our sample space, which is 52. All right, so when we simplify this fraction, 26 over 52, we're going to get one half, right? So that's why I said flipping a coin. We have a 50-50 chance of choosing a red card because there's only two colors. It's either red or it's a black, right? So 50-50 chance, or again, since we're using numbers, we're using the fraction one half. Now we are getting a little bit better or more complicated or more interesting, right? We wanna find the probability of choosing a face card or an ace card. And here, this is crucial, this word or, right? So again, if we wanna interpret this, um, this face card or an ace, okay? What does this mean? We, we want to have either a face card or an ace card. So um, how many, face cards do we have? So we have um, three for each suit. So we have a total of 12, right? So um, plus we have four of the ace cards, right? That we have a ace for the clubs, ace for the spades, ace for the hearts, ace for the diamonds, okay? What are we dividing this by? By our sample space, right? Our sample space is 52. So we have 12 plus four is 16, 16 divided by 52. Um, we simplify this fraction and we get again, four out of 13. So the probability of us choosing a face card or an ace card is four out of 13, yes? All right, let's move on. Um, assume that the probability of a couple having a baby boy is the same probability of a couple having a baby girl. If the couple has three children, find the probability that at least two of them are girls. So first of all, before I start this example, um, I like to point out, and, and it's like the obvious, and this is what sometimes the students um, think too much on these problems. Okay, if you think of, about your family, maybe you have some siblings, right? So so uh, I don't know if you were you're the oldest or you're the middle or you're the you're the youngest, but when when your parents were expecting children, you know they never knew what the the the, the sex was going to be, right? Or whether it was going to be a boy or it's going to be a girl until they either uh, your mom your your mom had a ultrasound or something, and then 
discovered if it was a boy or a girl, but but um, you don't know until um, it's born, right? And the other thing that I like to point out is that that um, it's probability. Um, the fact that you know um, you're if you were the firstborn and there was a boy, it doesn't mean that the next one has to be a girl. You, some of you guys know that. I, I, for instance, like my family, I have three boys. You know, um, they, there's no guarantee that the next one would be a girl, right? So, so it, it's all random. One event does not implicate the other. Yes. So let's go ahead and answer this. So it says that if the couple has three children, find the problem that at least two of them are girls. So they they want to have three children. So first. We need to find the sample space of the experiment, okay? So the best way to do this is to draw a tree diagram. So let me explain to you what we have here. So um, a couple wants to have three children. So there's two probabilities of having la the first one, right? The first one could be either a boy or it could be a girl, right? So let's stick with one. Let's say it was a boy the first time, but then from that boy, the second, the second sibling could be either a boy or a girl again, okay? And if we stick with the boy again, again, the third sibling, um, well, let's go down, okay? So let's say that the first child was a girl, the oldest was a girl, but from the girl, we have two options again. It could be a boy or it could be a, a girl, similarly, okay? So now let's start again from the top. Um, what if we had a boy? Well, after the third child, we have two possibilities again. It could be a boy or it could be a girl. What if it's a girl? Well, the same thing. If it, if the second sibling is a, or second child is a girl, the third child, we have two probabilities. We could be a boy or it could be a girl. And then the going down the tree, after the first child was a girl, let's say that the second child is a boy, but the third child could be a boy or it could be a girl. And then... Lastly, if we had a girl and then the second was a girl, the third child could either be a boy or it could be a girl. So if you could see um, my uh, my example in my family is that first line. It's just the first was a boy, second was a boy, the third was a boy, right? So they're, they're all boys. All right, so let's see here. So let's look at these values here. So this representation, again, of all boys is BBB. Um, the second representation would be BBG, boy, boy, girl. And again, the next one would be boy, girl, boy. Then the next one would be boy, girl, girl. And then girl, boy, boy, um, girl, boy, girl. And then girl, girl, boy. And then girl, girl, girl. Okay. Now I have some family members that were like that girl, girl, girl. Um, I'm happy that I'm not that one because, man, girls are hard. <laughs> anyway, okay, so um, here, if we see our sample space would be eight. All of our possibilities, we have count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's eight possibilities of this happening. So we now have our sample space in order to do our probability. So it says at least two of them are girls. So that means at least two means more than two, two or more, right? So at least two is two, but I can have all of them girls, right? All three of them, right? So here, um, let's write them out so you can see them. So we want to have boy, girl, 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 boy, girl. These are their two possibilities, girl, girl, boy, and girl, 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 where they're all girls. So if you see here, this is all the interpretations of two or more. So our answer is our event is four. So if we wanted to find the probability of this, it would be again this formula, the event over the sample space, which is four over eight. We had eight options, uh, four events, so it's half, right? Four over eight is one half. All right, and again, you see, hopefully um, in your test, when you're dealing with probabilities like this, trees are awesome. They, It's just looking at it and you get your answers, okay? All right, let's look at one more. An experiment consisting of rolling two fair dice, um, dice and adding the dots on the two-sided facing up. Okay, so again, um, a dice has um, six um, faces. Okay, and each face has um, dots. The dots represent the number 
of um, of that face, right? So for instance, if it has one dot, well, it, re it represents the number one. If it has six dots, well, it it's six, the number six, right? So a dice has six sides. So um, each face represents the count of one through six. Now, also, let me explain to you here what this means, fair dice. What does that mean, fair dice? Well, you know, um, fair dice means that that we have the probability of getting any, when we roll it, we can get one, two, three, four, five, six equally. They all have equally chances, meaning that um, sometimes you, um, they say that um, people have a loaded dice, right? That that it's always going to give you seven, because I'm sorry, uh, one, right? Not seven, because there's no seven. Um, it always gives you one, right? Um, but because it's designed that way that um, below the one is the six, and the six is heavy, so it's always going to be at the bottom. No, no, that's what fair dice means. That it's a, it's a, it's an equally um, distributed dice that all numbers have an equal chance of appearing. Okay, so let's look at this problem. It says find the probability the sum is not seven or eleven. Oh, not. So we have that word that we know how to represent. Okay, so the best way to see this is with this um, table here that describes all my sample space of rolling two dice, right? So we have, if we're rolling two dice, um, if you go down the, the table here, um, for instance, if I if the first dice is one, the second one could be one. That's what this means, one, one. And then I can go down all the way down to the end. So the last, the last square on the bottom, the six, six, that means that on the, the, one of the dice had a six and the other dice had also a six, okay? So, but we wanna find this event. Um, first, we, we can see from our table that our sample space is 36. Now, again, I'm giving you these answers, but hopefully you all know how to find sample space. So for instance, if I have two dice and, and, our, and each dice has six numbers, um, it's the product rule, right? To find our sample space would be six times six, which is the 36. Again, but here on the table, you can see that this is my sample space, right? Um, all right. So what we want is this. We want to find all that are not um, seven or 11. So here, if you see here, we have um, re re removing all of the ones that are six, okay? Um, um, excuse me, all the ones that are seven, six plus one is seven, five plus two is seven, four plus three is seven, three plus four is seven, two plus five is seven, one plus six is seven. But then I also want to remove the ones that are 11, right? So 11 is six and five, and five is six. Those are the only ones that are, are not 11, right? So not seven or 11 um, means that it's, um, we have this, six plus two is equals to eight, right? So here on our problem, um, we're going to um, the six plus two were from the seven or 11. So we're gonna subtract that from our sample space, which is 36. Um, uh, 36 minus eight gives us 28. So that is the element. The not seven or 11 are 28 items that are not these sums, right? So we're gonna divide it again from our formula, which is our sample space, which is 36. We always wanna simplify our fraction and it's gonna give us seven over nine. So it's a, a seven over nine chance that um, we will get a number that is not a sum of seven or not a sum of 11. And again, just to review again for your exam, when when the numerator and denominator are very close together or it's one, um, the, the division is one, meaning like if it's nine over nine, that means it's going to happen, right? It's very likely. So this is a strong chance because the seven and the nine is, are very close together. Those two numbers are very close together. That means that more than likely we will get a number that is not a sum of seven or not a sum of 11. All right, uh, let's look at this next example. It says an experiment consisting of rolling two fair dice and adding the dots on the two sides facing up. Again, we wanna count the dots um, to find our sum. So it says, find that probably the sum is less than four. All right, so now this word is less than. So we want not four, um, it doesn't say um, or, right, or 
less than or equal. No, it just says less than. So what that means is we only want a sum that is three, two. Um, we can't have a sum of one because we are rolling two dice. So the smallest sum that we can have is two. So technically, this is all we're looking at is any any combination where we have a sum of three and a sum of two. So again, if if I bring out my table again, um, when do I have this situation? Again, my sample space is 36, but um, here, these are our only um, options that we have a sum of less than four, right? The two plus one is a three, the one plus two is three, and the one plus one is a two. That's the smallest sum that we can have. So it's only three of them, okay? So the sum less than four is three elements. Again, our formula, is the event over the sample space. So my event is three, my sample space is 36. We simplify this and we get one out of 12. So see on this one, one is very far from 12. So it's not so much likely that we can get something like this. If we were playing and we wanted some less than three, our chances are very slim, okay? They're very, very small. All right. Um, so now let's look at this example. Again, we love marble problems. Um, a marble is drawn from a box containing three yellow, four white, and eight blue marbles. Find the following. The probability of choosing a yellow. Okay, so let's look at A first. So first, what we need to do is um, we always want to look at our sample space first. So our sample space means all the marbles that we are playing with. So here we have three yellow, four white, plus eight blue, total of 15 marbles. So that is my sample space, 15, right? All right. So um, now I want to find the event. I want to find the probability of a yellow. So what is my N of E or N of yellow, right? Um, is just three. My event of choosing a yellow is just three marbles. So again, applying my formula, the probability of the event over um, the probability of my sample space, the total. So this is three over 15. Again, let's simplify this fraction and we have one over five. So my probability of choosing a yellow is one fifth. One out of five chances, I will get a yellow. All right, um, how about B? The odds in favor in drawing a yellow card. Oh, so now they threw a new word at us the odds in favor, okay? So for the odds in favor, we have a formula to calculate whether something is um, in our favor or out of our favor. Uh, in this case, it's in our favor. Odds in favor is given by this formula. The probability of the event divided by the probability of the complement of the event, okay? That means that not occurring, all right? So, so first, let's look at the probability event, that which we know. Um, drawing a yellow, right? The favor over not favor, right? That's another way to see it. I love this um, this form of seeing the probability of the event or its complement. It means yes and not yes, right? So the odds in yellow are yellow and not yellow, right? So for instance, our yellow is three and not yellow is the white and blue, which would be the four and eight. So the four and eight would be 12. So we would have three over 12. We simplify this fraction and we have one over four. So we have one over four in our favor that we would choose a yellow. So that's one in four chances that we will get a yellow, okay? So that's how we interpret this probability. All right, so, <clears throat> and again, to write this, this is the fraction, but this is how we read it, one in four, right? There's a one in four chances that we will get a yellow. All right, so let's look at another application problem. So here we have um, just A, B, and C with D, E, and F, okay? And we have our totals. We have our totals for A, we have our totals for B, we have our totals for C. We also have totals for D, E, and F, okay? So let's go ahead and answer these problems, 4 through 16. Let's start with 14. So on this one, it says, find the probability of, excuse me, C with the intersection of E. Again, we only want the, the number that is in C, and in E, right? Just those two, okay? The intersection. All right, so here we have C. This is E. 
right? And we only want where these two lines intersect, the intersection, right? The, another word to see it, and we're putting it now visually as a line. Where do these two letters intersect? What's the value? It's 0 0.07. That is my intersection of C and E. All right, now let's look at 15. This one's a little bit different. So this is another formula problem. So we have the probability of D given B. That's how we represent this pi, uh, this line. It's like called a pipe. So this is conditional probability. And again, it's a formula to find this conditional probability of probability of E given F. We, our numerator is the probability of the event with the intersection of F divided by the probability of F, okay? So let's go ahead and do this problem. So this is our formula to calculate this conditional probability. So let's first find the easy part. The intersection, well, I, both of them are easy, right? So the intersection of D and B. So let's do it with lines again. Um, our line for D is here. Our line for B is this. So the intersection of D and B is where these two lines cross. What is that number where these two lines cross? 0 0.03. I want to find it, um, divide this number by the probability of B. That's just B, the total of B. So the total of B, again, what we have is this value here, the 0.10. This is the total of B. This is all of B. So this that's what this number is. It's 0.10. So when I do this division, 0 0.03 divided by 0.10, we have 3 over 10. Um, and that would be my answer. Okay. How about this last one? This is another conditional. Um, the probability of B given D. Conditional. And, and that's why we read it that way. Con that's why we write, we have this word conditional. Um, we want to find, there's a condition that we want to find the probability of B, B but the condition is that we're given D, right? That's why it's conditional, B given D. All right, so again, let's go ahead and do that. We're applying our formula uh, for this conditional probability, which is the probability of B with the intersection of D divided by D. Again, let's do our lines. What's the probability of B? It's all of these. What's the probability of D? It's all of these, okay? So where do these two lines intersect? At 0 0.03, so that is my numerator. Now the probability of D. D, I want the total of D, all of D. So the total of D is this value here, the 0 0.30. So that's my denominator. So when I divide 0 0.03 by 0 0.3, we have 1 over 10 again. Okay. So this is how we do conditional probability. All right. Um, let's look at this other problem, which is um, we will be able to... Uh, uh, apply our counting principle, okay? So we have here, how many different license plates are possible if each contains three letters followed by three digits? How many of these license plates contain no repeated letters and no repeated digits? Okay, so the way I, I like to do this is first, um, we need to know what we're dealing with. First, we have um, letters and digits. So we, in the English language, we have 26 letters um, in the alphabet, and we have 10 digits um, to make all the numbers, right? The 10 digits are from 0 through 9. With these 10 digits, we can count forever. Again, in the 26 letters, A through Z, yes? All right, so this is what we're dealing with. So how many different license plates are possible with this arrangement? So what I like to do is I like to do spaces, okay? They're telling me that the license plate is made out of three letters and three digits. So I have six paces to fill. All right. So here, um, the, it tells me that the first three um, contains letters. So um, let's say the first space. The first space for the letters and then the last three are for the digits. But let's think about it. Okay. We have 26 letters um, um, to to pick for each of these slots, and we have 10 digits to pick for each of the slots on the other half. So again, for our first one, we can choose from 26 letters. Second, we can choose from 26 letters again. Third is 26 letters. Now the digits. How many different digits can we choose for the options? Well, it's 10, 10, and 10. 
So to get the answer for this first part, how many different license plates are possible with this arrangement, it's called a counting principle that you write all of the possibilities that we can have, and then you multiply all the numbers together. So to get our, the answer is, again, we multiply all these six numbers and we get 17,570,600 um, number of ways we can have this arrangement. Three, three letters and three digits for a license plate. All right, let's do part two. Same as part one, but no repetition. How many license plate numbers were then possible, okay? So we found how many possibilities we can have. Now let's answer the second part. How many license plates contain no repeat letters, okay? So on this one, um, it's still the counting principle, but we have to think about um, um, without replacement, meaning that once we choose a letter or a number, we, we cannot use, use that number or letter again. So again, we're going to do it the same way as before. We have six options to do a license plate. Again, the first still have to be only letters. The second half can only be numbers. But now let's get started. The first option, our first one, we have 26 letters to choose from. But once we've chosen one of them, it doesn't matter which one it is, whether it was the A or the Z, right? We choose one of them. But then how many letters do we have then to choose for our second option? Well, it's one less. So this is 25. So now that we've chosen two letters, how many more options we have for the third? Well, now one less. So it would be 24 options, right? So this is to, to eliminate our duplicates, right? So now, or no repetitions. Now let's look at the digits. If our first one we pick, we can choose from 10 digits from the zero to nine. Uh, but let's say that I picked the zero. So that means I only have eight more options for the rest because I can't use that zero anymore. So I do one less for my second, which is nine. And then now that I have two digits, I have one less to choose from. So my third option is eight. So now then again, I would apply my counting principle again to get the total number of possibilities with no repetition is I just multiply all these numbers together. And when I do that, I get 11,232. Hundred uh, thousand, yes. Um, and excuse me, I read that wrong. 11,232,000. Same thing with the top one. I think I read it wrong. 17,576,000. All right. So, um, questions. And I, I feel sometimes I go too fast. All right. So, let's look at another uh, concept in probability. I think we're doing great timing, um, it, which is permutations and combinations. And these are the formulas for both permutations and combinations. But what I like to tell my students is this, okay? When I'm dealing with combinations, when I'm and dealing with probability, I want to find the order that it doesn't matter how the order comes. As long as I get what I want, I don't care how you're giving them to me. The order does not matter to me. Permutations is a different case. Permutation is when the order matters. Okay, so a great example I like to give my students is like, um, you know, especially right now that the Olympics are going on. The order matters whether a runner comes in first, second, or third, right? Um, you would be very mad if you were the first one to finish a race and they gave you the third um, prize, the bronze medal. Like, hey, I should get the gold because I came in first. So that type of ordering where the order matters is a permutation, okay? Um, a combination, example of a combination. Let's say you're going to Subway, right? And you want a sandwich with, with um, uh, lettuce, tomato, and bacon, right? Uh, who cares wh which they put first in the sandwich, whether it was the lettuce or the bacon or the tomato. It doesn't matter. As long as just those three items are there, that's all I'm interested in. That's what a combination is. When the order doesn't matter, as long as they're there, okay? All right, so let's look at examples, all right? So this is what I'm talking about, where the order matters, for the permutation and the order does not matter for combination. So let's look at this example. How many ways can a three person committee be selected from a committee of seven people? So here, this would um, possibly be a combination problem because it doesn't matter how I pick the committee members. I just need three to do a committee of seven. It doesn't matter who I pick first, who I pick second, who I pick third. So again, this would constitute um, <clears throat> a um, 
if the order matters or does uh, matters, but it doesn't, right? Does the order matter? The answer would be no, right? I don't care. As long as I have a committee of three, that's all I'm interested in. So I'm going to use this formula, the combination formula. So here, this is how we interpret this. This is seven choose three, okay? So from seven choose three, we have a formula where we have the n is the total number of people that we have, the three is the number that we're choosing. So we replace these variables. That symbol is not an exclamation symbol. That is the factorial symbol for mathematics. Um, and seven factorial um, over three factorial times seven minus three factorial. Now, um, just to um, help you understand how to do factorials, okay? Factorials is just um, the number um, multiplied by um, it's like the counting principle, but one less until you get to the end. So for instance, just as an example, three factorial would be three times two times one. That's the, the definition of the factorial. So three times two times one, that would be six, okay? But we wanna do a little bit of math manipulation here in order for us to do them without using a calculator, okay? So if you see here on my example, I was doing the factorial of seven, but I stopped at the four factorial. And the reason why I stopped at the four factorial is because, I, again, as my example, I told you that the three factorial is just three times two times one. But then I'm multiplying that times four factorial. Four factorial would be four times two times one. Um, that would be the four factorial. But I stopped because if I'm doing division with multiplication, these are opposites. These can cancel each other or can become one. Four factorial divided by four factorial is one. And then I no longer have to multiply that um that huge number right or all those numbers so we do a little bit of math manipulation to 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 help us with the math so when i divide four factorial divide four factorial again that gives me one or you guys like to say it cancels i'm only left with these these numbers but then i can cancel some more i have six can be um simplified with three times two three times two is six so six divided by six is one. Again, you can say it cancels, and then I don't have anything more to cancel. So this leaves with me a simple multiplication. Instead of multiplying 10 numbers, now I only have to multiply two numbers on the top, and I don't even have to do any multiplications on the bottom. The top gives me seven times five, which is 35, and the bottom is just one. So 35 divided by one is just 35, right? So again, we're doing a little shorthand so I don't have to pull out my calculator and do these long multiplications. All right, how about this one? How many ways can a president, vice president, a secretary be chosen from seven people? Oh, here the order matters, right? And actually we're, we're experiencing that right now. We have, we're in a year where we're looking into choosing a president, a vice president, and a secretary, right? Um, so it makes a difference who comes first for the president and who comes second for the vice president, who comes third for a secretary, right? In this case, again, if we're asking our question, does the order matter? Hopefully we all see that, yes, the order matters on this one. Who we choose first, who that's who is gonna be our president, vice president, secretary, and so on. All right, so in this case, we are dealing with a permutation. Because of permutation, the order matters. So again, just like before, we're choosing three people from seven. So again, it's seven, the permutation of three, seven choose three, but as a permutation again, I am I'm using my formula again, and I'm gonna apply the same concept, seven factorial over seven minus three, which is giving me four. I'm gonna do the seven factorial, uh, seven factorial and stop at the four factorials. That's six times five times four factorial, stop there. Don't wanna continue because on the bottom, I have just a four factorial. So again, four factorial divided by four factorial is one, or like you guys like to say, it cancels. So that just leaves me with seven times six times five, which is 210, yes? So the, my permutation for this is 210. All right, so again, we like to say um, the or for our permutations. And, and here we have how many permutations are there? It's three. So if they said or, how many permutations are there for three? So for the president is seven. Um, how many for the vice president? Six. For the secretary is five. Do the counting principle, multiply these values. Again, it's the 210 if I was applying my counting principle 
with the word or okay all right so i think this might be our last example here so we have a financial advisor offers a mutual funds in the high risk category seven in the moderate risk category and ten in the low risk category an investor decides to invest three high risk funds four moderate risk funds and three low risk funds how many ways can the investors do this again believe it or not this is an easy problem this is another uh, counting principle. So for our solution, if we really um, do this, does our order not, doesn't matter, right? It, we just want to find our eight mutual funds and our three, right? So we have investments of three from the eight in the high risk. So we have eight choose three, okay? We have um, seven from the moderate risk, and four, so from the seven, we're gonna choose four. And then the last one, um, the low risk, right? So we have 10 from, we have 10 total of the low risk, we wanna choose three. So we have combinations, 10 of three, okay? But these are all the values that we have for these. So when we plot them into our formulas, again, we get these numbers, 56, 35, and 120. But again, like I mentioned to you in the first part, um, this is a counting principle. This means these are all my options that I can choose here to get all of the possibilities. What do I have to do? I have to multiply all these numbers together. And when I multiply all these numbers together, I get this number, 235,200. So this is all many ways that investor can do these types of investments. Yes? All right. So um, I think we have one time to do this one. So let's Start with a Venn diagram, okay? So on this one, um, it's to practice Venn diagrams and it makes our probability a lot easier. So again, this most of the your instructors give this as an extra credit, I do the same. So this says 60 people were contracted and responded to a movie survey. The following information was obtained. So first, before I continue, one of the things that my students forget is you have to, when using or creating a Venn diagram, we always have to think of our sample size. So what is our sample space? Sorry, our sample space is 60 people. 60 people were, were contracted to respond to this survey, okay? So here, um, a Venn diagram is a box and it's a visual representation to do math. In here, um, because we have three different um, things that we're looking at. We're looking at um, are three different objects. We're looking at comedies, drama, and science fiction. So the objects are represented as circles, okay? Um, and um, what I see here is when 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 you're deal when you're dealing with with problems like this, you always want to start in the center if they all shared. So that's why the first one was highlighted in red. I had to write my circles where they're all overlapping because the first line says, six people like the comedies dramas and science fiction so that's where my first value will, will be okay um first again don't forget to write your universe the universe you can write it on the top left on the bottom right it doesn't matter um, um just as long as you have it indicated you always have to indicate your universe which in this case is a 60 people okay so again you always want to start from the center so on this one we, we're going to we're going to do letters to represent the objects. C for comedy, D for drama, um, and S for science fiction, okay? So we want to start at the intersection of all three, which is this. All We have six people that are like all three. That goes here. This is a, if you see this centerpiece, is part of all the three circles, okay? So I'm going to go quickly. Um, now, I, I and again, I work backwards. The intersection of C and D is this section here but i already have six so i have to subtract 13 from six which is seven that's what goes there that's the intersection of the the intersection of comedy and science fiction um, is 10 i already have six so 10 minus six is four again the intersection of drama and science fiction uh, is 11 i already have six so 11 minus six is five okay then i then i go to the comedies. There's 26 people in comedies, but I already have, I'm already accounting for 17. So 26 minus 17 is 9. Okay. In drama, there's 21, but in drama, I, I already have 
18. So I have to subtract um, 18 from 21, which will be 3. And then in the science fiction, there was 25. But again, in the 25, I already have 15. So I have to subtract 15 from 25. That gives me my 10. Now, um, when you do all these counts here, when you count all of the values in the circle, if you have any leftover uh, values, okay, when I add these all, all these numbers in here, I come up with 44. But the universe says that 60 people were contacted to do the survey. So what does that, the difference between the 60 and the 44, the 16 means that 16 got the survey, but didn't answer any of these. They probably said, oh, I don't like any of these. I like, I like, um, I don't know, action movies, or I like, um, I don't know, um, the uh, flick chick, right? Um, what they like to say. So, so they didn't answer any of these. So they answered something else. So that goes inside my universe, but they don't go. It's not part of any of my elements in the box. Okay. So again, um, this is how we do a Venn diagram. Um, and then we answer how many people like none of these movies. The answer would be sixteen. Again, um, thank you for joining me today um, for our last session of the Happy Math Hour. Uh, I wish you the best of luck um, in your exam and in the last week of classes, okay? Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Carizales, for your presentation. So we do want to remind everybody about our previously recorded sessions, which are available on the YouTube playlist. Uh, this session will be available on that playlist later today as well. Also linked is a short survey to help us improve our TVE sessions. If you guys can please take a few minutes to fill out that survey. And before you all leave, I want to share the TV sessions that we'll have next. So at 1 p.m. today in this room, we will have a presentation on volunteer opportunities and dog fostering with Elizabeth Oliva. And we will be back with Happy Math Hour next week at 11 a.m. where Math 1314 will cover finding zeros and the exam to review. Math 1324 will not have a session next week. So our 1 p.m. session next week will be a presentation on reading with Rose Galindo. Thank you all for coming in today. We hope you all have a lovely weekend. If you have any questions, feel free to use the chat box or the mic. We hope to see everyone again for Happy Math Hour.